Well, good morning, Westwood Church. We are continuing this week in our series, Summer in the Psalms, and today we are going to be hanging out in Psalm chapter 42. And as we begin, the first couple verses of the psalm have a really interesting picture to them. And so I want to just read them quickly for you, and I want to tell you a little bit of a story that just kind of helps me visualize uh, the image that it's giving us. So in, in verse 1, it says, As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? So in verse 1, it has this, this picture of a deer panting for water. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never personally witnessed a deer panting for water. Maybe you're in nature a lot and you, you hang out hunting and you've seen this in, in action, but for myself, I've never seen this. But one of the things I have seen is a dog panting. And lately we've been watching dog sitting this dog named Tucker, and he absolutely loves when we take him on long hikes. So me and my boys, we've been going on these long, sometimes up to 10, 15 kilometer hikes with with this dog Tucker, and, and especially if it's a hot day, he begins to pant. You know, the tongue's out, and he's like, <laughs> and he's just panting. He's longing for water. And inevitably, when we're going through the forest, we always come up to some lake or a stream, or even a mud puddle will do for him. And as soon as he sees it, he is just like running for it, and he just jumps in, and he starts lapping up the water. And there's this, there's this idea, when you, when you picture that, there's this image of, of just this idea of thirst. And when he sees that, he just, he just goes for it. He's willing to do whatever he needs to do to satisfy that thirst. And for him, it means he's perfectly comfortable drinking out of a mud puddle. But I want you to, I want you to imagine, with this whole idea of thirst in mind, I want you to imagine a time in your life when you remember being really thirsty. Maybe it was a day at the beach where you were hanging out and you just sat in the sun too long and didn't drink enough fluids and you were maybe a real tad on the dehydrated side. Uh, maybe it was uh, you went out for a run and you, you didn't take a water bottle with you and by the time you got back you were really thirsty or some athletic competition or whatever the, whatever the time is in your mind that you remember being really thirsty I want you to think about that image. And then I want us to wrestle because the image he, he, he gives is this image of being thirsty for God's presence. He, he, he relates this idea of the deer panting and longing for water to this idea of him longing and thirsting for the presence of God. And, and when you think about that image in your mind of of being thirsty, do you, do you thirst and long in the same way for God? And, and, and what would you be willing to do to seek the presence of God in your life, to seek out God in your life, to feel his presence, to, to hear him speak into your life? What, what, are, what, are the, what are the things you would be willing to go to? What lengths would you be willing to go to to pursue the presence of God in your life. The passage, it, it continues then in verse 3 and 4, and he talks about how he says in verse 3, My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Now, he, the, the author of this, which, are, which were the sons of Korah, it's likely that they had been taken off uh, into captivity and they were not able to go to the temple and worship God um, with their fellow Jews. They, they didn't have that experience anymore in this season. And, and so part of what he's mourning for, part of why he's longing for, part of why he doesn't maybe necessarily sense the presence of God in the same way and longs for that, is the author, one of the ways that they really sense God's presence is when they were praising God in corporate worship with others. 
in this case, in the temple. And, and, and he, he has this picture of leading a group of people to the temple to worship God, and then this experience of corporate worship in the temple, and he longs for that experience, which, when you think about it, is, is in some ways pretty applicable to where we're at right now. Some of you are maybe longing to get together on a Sunday morning and to sing worship to God together and to, to hear the, the Word of God preached together in a, in a corporate setting and to just worship God. For some of you, those times when you're here on a Sunday morning, those are the times when you really, really feel God and feel His presence in a meaningful way in your life. And so maybe you, like the sons of Korah, are longing for that time when you can do that again, when you can feel God's presence in, in a corporate worship setting. Uh, maybe that's you. And, and, and as we go along, uh, I want you to notice something that the sons of Korah realized that is even more evident in our own lives. And so we'll, so we'll get there. But then, but I, before we get there, I want us to recognize that mourning and lament is a valid response to not feeling God's presence. Whatever the reason you might not feel God's presence. It may, maybe corporate worship isn't the time where you really feel God's presence. But however you feel God's presence, if you're going through a season where you don't sense his presence, it's appropriate to mourn that. It's appropriate to lament that. It's an appropriate thing to be sad about the fact that you are in a season where you're not experiencing God's presence. And we're going we're gonna to talk about kind of a strategy to work through uh, when you're in that season as we go through the passage together. But then in verse 5, so he, he kind of starts with this lament in verses 1 to 4, but then in verse 5, he changes his tune a little bit, and he says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So what I want us to recognize here, and this is the first cycle of this, is in the passage, and, it, and many people say that Psalm 42 and 43 actually were meant to go together. So in, these, in this passage, there's actually this cycle then of lament and then hope, and then lament again, and then hope. And so the first one that we saw here is in verses 1 to 4, there's this lament of, of longing for God's presence and longing to experience God's presence corporately in, in temple worship. That's, that's the first main lament uh, that he speaks about. And then in verse 5, he, he goes into this expression that he's going to put his hope in God and, and, he, and he has hope that he one day is going to feel God's presence again in a meaningful way. And so he, he goes into this hope. And we're going to see in verses 6 and 7 the same idea. Verses 6 and 7, there's going to be another lament followed by hope and another lament followed by hope. And, and what I want us to recognize, yes, let's, let's have a look at what are the things he, that the author is lamenting about, but let's also think about what are the things that give him hope? What gives him hope? In the midst of this difficult situation that he's clearly in, what is it that gives him hope? Because as we're going to as we're going to see, there's also a pattern in every lament and then hope cycle. There's this idea of him, the author, talking about what the current hardship is, pouring out his heart to God about what the current hardship that he's going through is. He speaks of this, and then the next thing that he does is he remembers, and we're going to talk about the different things he remembers. But he remembers times in his life when he did feel God's presence. He remembers times when he did see God moving in significant ways. And so he goes into this cycle of remembering. And as he goes into this cycle of remembering, he then comes out of that with this idea of anticipation of what God will do. Yes, I'm in a hard time, but I remember some of the amazing things God's done in my life and so I believe, and I'm going to hope with anticipation about the things God will one day do again. And so I want you to, to see this um, pattern that, as we continue to go through. And so what I want to do now is I want to read uh, the rest of the passage, both the laments and the hope. And then we're going to talk about a few things that he remembers 
that help him to put his hope and trust in God even in the midst of hardship. So verse 6 says, My God, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. So there's the lament. Then in verse 8, he says, he, he speaks of his hope again. And he says, by day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me a prayer to the God of my life. I say to the God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Verse 11, here's the hope. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So one of the first things I notice in the first cycle, the thing that he remembers is he remembers what God has done. He remembers how he felt God's presence in that corporate worship setting. So he remembers back to that time when God had done something significant in his life, when he had felt God in in that worship moment, where he saw him work in that corporate worship setting. He remembers that. And that gives him hope that one day he's going to experience that, that opportunity. He's going to again have that opportunity to worship God together with others and experience God in that way that is so meaningful to him. In the second frame, he remembers, he remembers who God is and that God is with us, right? Verse 8, he says this in verse 8. He says, In verse 8, he says, By day the Lord directs his love. So he remembers that God is loving and that in the day he can experience his love because God's presence is with him. And at night his song is over me. So he, he begins to recognize that even though he can't go to the temple, that God's presence is with him both day and night. And for us, this, this has a- added meaning because as followers of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've decided to give your life to him and follow him, then the Holy Spirit has actually come and lives in you. Your spirit is now connected with his spirit. And you always are within the presence of God because the presence of God actually dwells within you. You are the temple. God's presence dwells in you. It doesn't dwell in a building anymore. It dwells in each individual that chooses to follow Jesus. And so for us, even more than the sons of Korah who wrote this psalm, we know that day and night, regardless of what situation we may find ourselves in, that day and night, God's presence is with us. Whether we sense it, whether we feel it, the reality is God's presence is always with us as a follower of Jesus. And and this should give us great hope that, that God is with us no matter what we face, no matter, despite the fact that we can't meet together regularly on a Sunday morning like we might prefer. Despite all that, God's presence is with us daily, and we can daily turn to him, as the psalmist says in verse 8, in prayer. And, and so we have this opportunity to meet with God on a regular basis and experience his presence in that way. And so that, that should give us hope. And, that, and, and he remembers regularly, he talks about remembering when he did feel God's presence. So for me, uh, when I was like 17, I had this really, really incredible, profound experience with God where I just had this sensation of almost like feeling God's arms around me and, and just this sense that God really deeply loved and cared for me. And sometimes when, when God's presence seems far away, I go back and I remember that time when I felt God's presence closer than any other time possibly um, in my life. There's been other real moments where I felt his presence in a really strong, profound way. And, and in those moments, I remember, oh yeah, I, I have felt God's presence in meaningful ways. And so even in, when I'm in that season where I don't feel it as much, I remember those times when I do, and it gives me hope that I will feel his presence again. And even if, even if it's not in this life, certainly in the life to come. 
although I believe and hope and trust, even in this life, I'll experience his presence um, on an ongoing basis. Then he remembers who God is in a big way. So if we look at verse 11, the thing he remembers is he says, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. Why? Because he's my Savior and my God. He recognizes who God is, that God is Savior. He is powerful enough to save, and he is God. He is worthy of praise. He is almighty. He is God. And so because of who he is, I can choose to place my hope in him even in the midst of hardship, even in the midst of difficult situations. And for many of us, that should give us great hope because for many of us, we have, in this whole COVID season, for some of us, it's been really, really challenging times. Maybe it's been challenging for you because you're an extrovert and you haven't been able to, to be around people as much as you'd like. And so that has been a struggle. But even if you're an introvert, there's probably been times when not being as connected to people has been a challenge. How, how do we navigate that? And how do we remember to place our trust in God in the midst of that? For some of us, this season has caused financial strain and difficulty. And how do we put our trust in God when our finances are stretched to the limit? There's so many different reasons. Some of us have lost employment and we're wrestling with what, what do we do next? What, what comes next in this, in this season of life? And we, we have to remind ourselves of, of who God is and the good things he's done in our life so that we can continue to, to, to place our hope in him and to have hope in life and remember that, that it's not always going to be like this. And that one day, Jesus is actually going to make all things the way that they are to be. And there won't be any more suffering and there won't be any more hardship. But even in this life, I put my hope in God that though there may be seasons of hardship, there are also seasons of joy. And there are also seasons of feeling his presence in meaningful ways. And it's important to remember those things in times of hardship. One of the things that I've had to learn to do, because I think um, for many of us, the easy thing to do when we're, when we're feeling uncomfortable, when we're feeling anxious, when we're feeling troubled, when we're feeling frustrated, we want to flee from that. We want to get out of that uncomfortable space as quickly as we can. We want to avoid hardship. We want to avoid struggle. We want to avoid anything that's hard. We want a life of comfort and ease. And one of the things that I've had to learn um, going through my life is how I can sit in that uncomfortable place with God. In the midst of that current struggle, that current hardship, how do I sit in that uncomfortable place with God? Pouring out my heart, as the psalmist said um, in verse 4, even with tears, how do I sit in that place? How do I be honest with God? How do I be vulnerable with Him about where I'm at? But still, in the midst of pouring out my heart, remembering the things He has done and who He is, so I can place my hope in Him in spite of the circumstances that I'm in. Because if we're honest, the people that, that really, really inspire us are not so much the people that everything just seems to, to work out for. It's the people who can walk through hardship and still put their trust in God. The people who can walk through hardship and still find joy. Those are the people that inspire us. And, and I think part of the secret of how people like that do it is they're able to sit in that uncomfortable place with God. They're able to be vulnerable and pull out pour out their hearts to him, but they're also able to have a heart of gratitude for remembering all that God has given them, all that they've enjoyed, all that they've experienced with God. And so they put their hope in him, that regardless of whether they feel relief from this situation in their life or not, they put their hope in God that one day, whether it's on this side of eternity or on the other, it's not going to be like this and that God cares about them, and that God loves them, and that God's presence is always with them.
And so, in bringing us full circle, I want to come back to this idea. And I want you to think about, if you're currently in a situation that's hard, you're going through a trial, you're going through hardship, I want you this week to take some time to sit with God in that uncomfortable place. Sit with Him and pour out your heart to Him about how you're feeling, what you're thinking about your current hardship the struggle that's within you. Pour that out to God. He can take it. He wants you to be vulnerable and honest and real with Him. That's how we develop a real, deep, intimate relationship with Him, is by being real about who we are and what we're feeling and what we're going through. But then, as you do that, I want you to think about times in your life where you remember, you remember, maybe it's something incredible God did in your life. Maybe it's a time where you just felt his presence in such a real, meaningful, tangible way. Whatever it is, I want you to remember who God is, what he's done in your life, so that your attitude shifts from despair to hope. So that you might be able to anticipate what God will do. You might be able to anticipate feeling his presence again in a meaningful way. And so this week, if this is you, if you're going through a current hardship, I really encourage you to do this. Pour out your heart about your current hardship. Remember what God has done and who he is and anticipate, look forward with anticipation about what God might be doing in your life. Because every hardship we go through is an opportunity for growth. It's an opportunity for God to do work on our hearts, to do work on our minds, to draw us closer to himself. But we get to make that choice. Do we choose to stay here and hang out here in despair? Or do we choose to remember who God is, what he's done, and look forward and hope in him about what he will one day do? That's my prayer for you. And I want to also encourage you, maybe this isn't you. Maybe you're not in a place where you're struggling right now. But I guarantee you that you know somebody who is. Would you join them? Would you join them in that uncomfortable place and sit with them in that pain, in that hardship? Would you sit with them? And would you, would you even, maybe if you know them well, would you maybe even reminisce with them and, and help them remember in a, in, a, in a loving, gracious way. Help them remember the things God has done and maybe praise God for those things and then pray and look forward with them to anticipate what God might do in their life. Would you sit with them? Would you enter into that process with them? So those are my two challenges. If this is you, go through this. If this isn't you, find someone who you know who is and maybe sit with them in this and walk through that with them that we might carry one another's burdens with each other. With that, I want to close in prayer. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you so much that your presence is always with us even when we don't necessarily feel it. And Jesus, uh, for those that are going through current hardship, God, would you just give them the, the blessing of, of feeling your presence and, and, and knowing that you are with them in that season? And God, would you even stir in their hearts memories of the times when you have worked in powerful ways in their life, the times when they felt your presence the strongest? And would, would you just help them to come to a place where they remember who you are and the things you've done? And God, would they be able to place their hope in you? Help us to do that. Help us to not lose hope. Help us to not give in to despair. But help us to walk in gratitude and in anticipation of all that you have for us um, in life. And may we, may we continue to praise you, for you are our God and you are our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.